Hello, and welcome back to EEX 367, Introduction to Autonomous Robotics, and Robotics 320, Robot Operating Systems. Um, this will be our fifth lecture of the semester, where we'll be talking about uh, motion control and PID controllers, um, and, and also how they relate to, to assignment two. Um, and so kind of on a similar note, it's been, you know, uh, congratulations on getting assignment one uh, complete. Uh, it's been really cool seeing seeing your pendulums work, uh, and uh, and and seeing the the continued you know good discussions we've been having in the interactive sessions and on Slack um, and during during the lab sessions. Uh, so I'm you know I'm, I'm really pleased with uh, with how the semester has been going so far. Um, and so before we get into today's lecture, I'll go ahead and and minimize myself so we can all see the the slides. All right, so the topic for today's lecture is uh, motion control, uh, and so how it is that we can control our robotic actuators. Um, so you can see on the slide here, uh, these segways would be one example of an inverted pendulum system that has to be controlled. Uh, another way that we could think about today's lecture would be, uh, you know, as sort of thinking about it as the smooth criminal lecture. Um, so if you're not familiar with, uh, with Michael Jackson's smooth uh, criminal video, uh, there, this would be another example of sort of an inverted pendulum system. Uh, you know, which is a pretty impressive dance move, but um, but from a roboticist standpoint, it's also a really interesting control problem and kind of uh, control mechanism. Um, so if you're not familiar, you know, you can watch the you know you can watch the, the YouTube video for that for that music video, or you know if you're interested, the the term for that dance move, well, where they sort of lean forward in that inverted pendulum fashion, is what's called the the anti gravity lean, um, and so it turns out that some people are really, really well practiced at, uh, at doing this. And so here's a couple of examples of some people that are really, really impressive with their, uh, with their sort of ankle strength and core strength in, in being able to, to perform this. So here's another one that's also goes really, really low. Um, and so, yeah, so as a roboticist, these are really, really impressive examples of, of control mechanisms. And so one thing that's, um, that you'll typically see is roboticists will try and sort of imitate what they, what they see humans do or what they see nature do uh, in terms of their control or their planning and so forth. And so here's an example of, of someone that uh, kind of cleverly put together um, a sort of, uh, you know, Michael Jackson themed um, robot, <laughs> which, is, which is quite cool based on this, you know, smooth criminal set of dance moves. Um, but it's not just these, these sort of toy examples that we can come up with in robotics. There's also, uh, you know, really, really, really impressive um, you know, engineering problems at, at hand in, in modern robotic systems. So here's an example of a bipedal robot from, from the lab of, um, of Jesse Grizzle here at the University of Michigan. Uh, so this is a Cassie robot that's walking across the wave field just on, on North Campus. Um, and so, you know, while they're not, while it's not dancing here, um, it, is, it is still having to control all of the various actuators to maintain uh, kind of stable balance and, and achieve um, a sort of viable motion plan. Um, and so they've they've done some really impressive work with with these robots. So here's an example of of that robot actually operating um, stably on a on a Segway. Um, and so and so once again, it's it's really it's really cool to see this kind of thing. Um, it's really pretty exciting. And so one of the things though that's maybe the most impressive, right, is that the stable or is it that the system here really is stable in its control. And so. You know, ultimately, what that comes down to, in terms of what's going to enable, the, you know, these robots to to remain stable, is that their controllers have to operate uh, at a really high kind of frame rate, or like a really high refresh rate, right? So the controllers have to be very, very fast, and the control has to be applied very frequently in order for it to to be um, to be successful, right? So, kind of as a somewhat humorous example of what we might expect to see if if the controllers were not operating very fast, right, or they weren't reacting to their environment would be something like this, right, where the robot might kind of fall over and not be able to, to maintain the, in this case, that, that uh, kind of inverted pendulum anti-gravity lean position. Um, but in general, right, if, if the controller can't keep up with the physical, uh, you know, kind of system that it that exists within, right, so with, with, uh, with the forces that act on it, with gravity and friction and so forth, um, then the controllers ultimately are not going to are not going to be viable, and so one of the things that enables these controllers to be um, to be effective in this kind of high frequency um, setup is that they have to be able to uh, to communicate with the actual with the actual actuators. And so 
one way that we could think about control is it's is it's somewhat like a sort of central nervous system um, within within biological systems that's that's responsible for coordinating the the um, the actions with within the software and also within the hardware. Um, and so communication then between that software and hardware serves as a really crucial backbone to, um, to, to these control systems. Um, so for example, if we look at the, at the fetch robot and we try and kind of think about what um, the control, the, the kind of control pipeline would, would look like, right? So starting out with, you know, kind of at the center of this whole process is a, is a computer, right? And so the computer exists on board the robot uh, and is responsible for uh, for for this control uh, for this control pipeline, where within this within this main computer, it's going to be communicating with um, with a set of of joints, um, and so for each joint, then you're going to have a separate controller uh, that is actually that's actually being op uh, basically updated throughout time and being told how that controller should um, should be should be applied to the to the robotic actuators, the actual motors. And so as these, as these controllers update the, the sort of state of the control for each joint over time, they have, to, they have to run these updates at a very high frequency, like we were saying, in order for them to keep up with, with the environment. Um, and so what this looks like then in terms of, uh, in terms of a, like a realistic um, kind of setup on the hardware is you'd have, you'd have a setup that looks something like on the left, where we break it up into... Um, into a set of software components and then a set of hardware components that have to that have to communicate, right? So within the software we have the actual controllers, right? And these controllers are then going to be communicating with the actual hardware components at a really high frequency, right? So in this case, for example, we might expect to see controllers operating at let's say a thousand times per second, so like a thousand kilohertz on on a system like the Fetch, um, and so and so within that then the the hardware is responsible for for uh, essentially receiving the 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 control signals from that come from the from the software from the computation side, um, so this would be implemented on basically like a motor control board, um, and that motor control board then is responsible for physically actuating whatever control signals come out of the come out of the software. Um, and so, the other kind of high level way that we could that we could break this down um, would be would be with the 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 sort of terms that are shown then on the left, right? So at the highest level, we have something uh, coming from a robot application, which would be a set of actions. Those actions get interpreted by the, by the lower level joint controllers within software. Um, and then those, those lower level joint controllers essentially define a set of set points within configuration space that each of the joints should take in order to, to achieve the, the desired action. Right? And so once those set points are defined, they can be communicated to the hardware and converted into motor commands, uh, where then at the final stage, at the sort of most low-level stage, uh, those motor commands actually get physically actuated in the, in the motors that exist on the, on the robot. Um, and so this, this framework right, of this kind of high level at the top of, of actions moving all the way down to, to low-level um, motor commands should be, should be pretty similar to the to some of the ideas we talked about when uh, when we sort of introduced this notion of, of robot operating systems, so so to summarize this topic of a mo motion control, we could we could describe it as the follows, right? So we could say that a motion control is the process um, by which a robot can achieve and maintain some desired state for some of its joints by applying motor forces based on some current perceived um, current perceived state, and so. Um, and so within this then, right, so if we kind of trans translate this to our, to our robot operating system framework, we can see that it matches really quite, quite nicely where there was that sort of high level robot application moving down towards the low level hardware. And so within this course, once again, if we look at the topics that we're gonna be, that we're gonna be focusing on in this course, um, so here's that, here's that diagram we looked at uh, towards the start of the semester of the various modules within a robot operating system that we might want to, to implement for our robots to be effective uh, in, in, um, in implementing robot applications. And so highlighted in green, right? So that was the path planning project was, was based on le content from lecture two, uh, which, we've, which we've gone through. Our last lecture, lecture four, was on dynamical simulation. And so that was how robots can simulate their physical environment in a high fidelity, in a high fidelity manner by computation. And so this lecture then is on feedback control. Right, so this lecture then is gonna 
um, essentially be integrated with, with the dynamical simulation material in order for us to implement, implement our assignment too. And so if we look forward a little bit, what we're going to be talking about then in, in the kind of coming future um, is we're going to get into forward kinematics and inverse kinematics um, and, and a set of other uh, sort of exciting projects. But if we go back to, um, to project two, so, so project two has been released. Um, so we talked about it uh, on lab last week in our third lab of the semester. And so this particular project we call Pendulum. And so this is going to combine the dynamical simulation material uh, where we're going to be implementing equations of motion for the, for the pendulum um, and feedback control. So, so based on this lecture, we're going to be talking about how proportional integral derivative or PID control can be used to, uh, to, to actuate a pendulum in our simulated environment. Um, and so putting these two pieces together is then what's going to allow us to, to implement our, our assignment too. So from assignment two, one question then that we could ask is, what can we really do with a, with a, a single link pendulum? Um, and so one, one example of some, of some really cool projects comes from, uh, from the EECS 473 class here at the University of Michigan, um, where, they, where students implement an inverted pendulum like the one shown here. So in this case, there's the, the robot body itself can be thought of as the single link. And the task then of the of the controller of this robot is to is to kind of maintain the stable state of the of the robot being held up while still on these uh, you know while, while while on these two wheels, um, and so in this case, so by inverted pendulum, what what we're referring to is the fact that the um, that the pendulum link is being held up and kind of um, in uh, in uh, in resistance to to, to gravity. Um, and so as you can see here, like the, the students are able to kind of push the robot or introduce external forces and the controller can still handle, can still handle those forces and react, um, and react accordingly. Um, so here's another example of, of one of these projects, um, which is again, it's very nice, stable motion, smooth control. If the, you know, the, it'll tip over a little bit, but it should correct itself. Let's see. Yes, I correct itself there, and so you can see it's it's a nice it's a nice example of how of how these pendulums can can be um, can be implemented on on physical devices. Uh, another kind of humorous one is is this case of a sort of like monster truck inspired robot, um, uh, which is really pretty cool as well. Um, and so in this case, the the robot's actually moving forward in addition to staying stable. Um, and so there are some really cool projects you can do with uh, with these inverted pendulum systems. Um, but in, in addition to that, you know, these, this, this notion of a pendulum, of a single link pendulum, uh, is a foundational concept that, you know, within kind of robotic actuation and control, that you can build upon to create more complicated systems and more kind of capable robots. Um, so for example, when you, start, when you start chaining together these single link pendulums, you can get full, uh, full arms, full robotic arms that are able to do more complex, more uh, kind of manipulation based tasks like like shown here for example from from the EECS 467 class where students implemented a robotic painter um, and so in this case right so if we if we look at this robot what you'll recognize is that it really is just a series of single link pendulums that are sort of stacked in in sequence um, and so with that though you can then get you know the ability to um, to not just have like an inverted pendulum but you can have control of of objects within the environment and then you can manipulate objects um, and, and, and in this case, paint a nice uh, picture. Okay, so before we go into uh, control for the, for the pendulum, let's briefly revisit the topic of dynamical simulation that we talked about last lecture, um, just with a, with a few examples um, in, in addition to simulating the pendulum, just to kind of motivate uh, some, of, some of the integrators that we talked about and to demonstrate some of the um, kind of exciting um, exciting, uh, you know, possibilities that, that we can, um, that we can use our, our physical simulation for. Um, so one kind of exciting example, uh, is, is shown in this demo here. So if you click the link in the slides, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see it, or I will change over and we can, and we can take a look at it. So if you follow the link, you'll, you'll be taken to, um, to, to this code pen page that, that looks like this. 
And so one of the one of the you know this is showing a really neat demo of physical simulation based on a Verlet integrator, similar to the one that we're implementing for for assignment two, um, where the the difference is that instead of implementing a, a simulator for for a single link pendulum, um, what what the what the creator of this of this example has done is they've implemented actually a physical simulator for a for sort of a mesh cloth. Um, so you can see here. So as I as I interact with the cloth. Um, so as I kind of click on the screen and drag my mouse, the cloth is, is fully simulated um, is fully simulated in this environment. So you can see that there's interactions between between the different uh, kind of particles within this mesh um, and and then how they react with with gravity and and the dynamics of the of the of the environment. Uh, and so it's it's really kind of a cool simulator. So you can see so you can kind of be gentle with the mesh and it'll sort of have this. Um, you know, smooth behavior. You can also be much more kind of chaotic with it, also to the point of actually breaking the the mesh. So if you if you kind of move like kind of swing it back and forth enough, you can see it'll sort of tatter uh, in certain sections. And so as you as you do that, it can tatter more and more, right? And it still maintains this um, you know really quite quite realistic um, simulation of what you would expect to see in the, in a real mesh cloth. Uh, but you can keep doing this all the way to the point of like really just destroying the mesh, the mesh completely, um, and so it's kind of fun to do that as well. Um, and so this is just kind of a fun demo uh, to kind of show one, um, you know, an another possibility with our uh, with our Verlet integrators. So if we step back now, let's let's talk about how this simulator is uh, is working. So if we look at how this this simulator is actually is actually implemented. Um, what it you know what it turns out to be is uh, is a is a representation of this cloth based on a set of point mass. So each each node within the within the grid that that makes up the mesh is actually treated as a node within within a graph uh, where the where the node is, um, is is representing a point mass within within the simulator. And so neighboring nodes then within this mesh mesh cloth graph. Uh, are connected by sort of physical constraints representing the sort of stiffness um, that of the of the uh, of the material that connects those points in the in the corresponding in the corresponding mesh. So if we zoom in and try and understand what this looks like, so within within each of these grid points, there's a, there's a set of point mass particles, and so each point mass particle then can be simulated based on um, based on uh, the underlying physical laws, right? So for example, you could have uh, gravity acting on the particles as was shown in the demo, um, which can be applied as a force to the individual particles. Um, but in addition to this, the, the other um, kind of key detail of, of this particular simulation that we looked at is that there's this enforcement of, of kind of relational constraints between, between adjacent point masses. Um, and so in particular, this, this constraint is that there should be a sort of spring property and a stiffness property that would kind of uh, hold together the, the the mesh of particles and is ultimately what produces that cloth-like behavior. Uh, and so within this, uh, so if you dig into the into the code for this example, what you'll find is that um, that these actual spring spring constraints are implemented based on a set of kind of relational distance uh, comparisons. Um, and so we're not gonna we're not gonna dig too much into this, but uh, but if you're curious what uh, so, you know, this slide has some of the equations, and if you dig through the code, you'll you'll see more. Um, but essentially, it's that combination of the applying the physical laws, which is what our simulators for the single link pendulum will do, but then in addition, incorporating these these um, spring constraints in order to in order to keep the particles kind of related in a in a mesh like fashion. And so, this type of uh, spring based constraint simulation is not only applicable in that kind of simple example we looked at, but you can extend it to more realistic simulations uh, like the one shown on, on this slide, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, but just to preface, so, so this, uh, this animation here is built on 3.js. Uh, and so 3.js is this rendering library that we're going to be using starting uh, in assignment three. So for doing three-dimensional rendering uh, in the browser. Um, but this, this particular demo that we'll look at here just shows a, a more complicated way that we could use Simulation of a, of a mesh cloth uh, with uh, within within a nice uh, physical environment. So if you navigate to this page, you'll see you'll see the simulator uh, like the one shown here, 
Um, and so, so this is a a live uh, simulation of this of this mesh cloth attached to actually a robotic arm, and behind it then is um, is a set of blocks that are fully simulated in conjunction with the robotic arm and the and the mesh cloth. So so to sh to to give an example here, so as I as I press the controls here, uh, what will happen is the robotic arm will will begin to actuate, and so you'll see the the mesh will be simulated, and it'll actually have an effect on the blocks within this uh, within this wall. So you can see it's knocking the blocks over. Um, so so this simulator is even a little bit more advanced than the one that we looked at a moment ago, where it can where it can model collisions between the different point masses that are represented within the environment. So the, the point masses on the mesh and the point masses on the on these colored blocks. Um, and so, you know, th this is actually pretty cool. This is actually, you know, quite similar to what we're going to be working towards. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be working with more realistic robots than just this simple um, one degree of freedom arm. Um, but this this kind of gives a, a nice example of what uh, of what you can do with three JS and also what you can do with with uh, physical simulators like the ones that, that we're implementing uh, for, for assignment two. All right, so let's go back to the slides. Now that we've taken a look at dynamical simulation and had a little bit of a refresher on that topic, let's also go back briefly and, and revisit the pendulum and specifically how we're defining the, uh, the state of the pendulum as we start to move towards the, the control topic. So, if you if you recall from from our last lecture where we discussed the the physical simulation of the of the pendulum, one of the key topics was how we defined the the state space or sometimes referred to as the configuration space of the pendulum. And so in this course, we're using what's called generalized coordinates, where in our simulation the the motion that we are simulating is with respect to the to the system's degrees of freedom. Right. So in the in the pendulum case, the there's one degree of freedom, which is the one revolute axis about which the pendulum can uh, can art can articulate or can can rotate about um, but this isn't the only way that you could define the configuration space for a, for a pendulum system and so it is sometimes common like you you, you might see if you're reading about um, about configuration spaces to see what's called maximal coordinates as being an alternative approach uh, and so in maximal coordinates the 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 distinction is that instead of instead of representing the system with respect to its degrees of freedoms, you would, you would sort of express every component, component of the system in terms of its, in terms of its uh, let's say, location within, within state space. Um, and so, you know, a, reason, like a good question to ask then is why it is that we, we use generalized coordinates as opposed to, to maximal coordinates. So, so to give an example, right, so in the pendulum case, maximal coordinates, instead of being, like, instead of representing the pendulum as just its current uh, its current angle about the rotationing uh, axis, which we do in generalized coordinates, you could express the pendulum in maximal coordinates by saying the explicit, let's say, x, y, or maybe x, y, z position of just the pendulum bob. Um, and so the reason as to why we use generalized coordinates, why we prefer generalized coordinates, is because that, that notion of a degree of freedom translates very nicely to how it is that we actually can can affect the system with our with our robotic actuators. So what I mean by that is that in this, like in the pendulum case, as an example, we have this this torque term tau, which is directly affecting the degree of freedom of the pendulum, which is the theta, right? So ta the motor torque directly affects the rotational degree of freedom, as opposed like, and it then indirectly affects let's say the X, Y, Z position of the, of the pendulum bar, or like end effector. Um, and so for this reason, you know, so another way of saying that is that the, the motor force that we have access to in this system is, is expressed via the, the degree of freedom of the system. Um, and so this, this notion is common kind of throughout other, other robotic systems, not just the pendulum. Um, and so, so that's one reason why generalized coordinates are, are preferable um, in, in this in this uh, in this setting, um, and so so one um, so another way that we could kind of look at this right is just to to remember that at this at this uh, center point of the pendulum or at this kind of base of the pendulum in in our simulation there is a, there's a motor there uh, and so this motor can affect the the state of the pendulum by 
by applying a torque, right? And so in the case of, of control, the goal is going to be to define, you know, we're going to have some set point defined. Um, so this is going to be the, the pendulum angle that we want our controller to, um, to configure the pendulum to take. Um, and so the, so the goal then of our controller is to decide how, how much motor force it, it needs to apply, how much torque it needs to apply at the base in order to cause the pendulum to swing up towards that, towards that set point. So by applying the motor force, the pendulum, the pendulum state will be affected, right? So the, the degree of freedom will directly be affected. And so, so let's briefly go back and talk a bit more about how these, how these actuators are, are actually implemented in robotic systems. Um, so as a little bit of a refresher, we, we, we talked briefly about servos uh, in, our, in our last lecture. Right, so servos are, are what is actually the, the, the physical hardware in robotic systems that, that, uh, that allows them to, to actuate. And so one servo is a collection of kind of three core, core kind of components, right? So the one thing is there's, a, there's the actual motor, right? So there's an electric physical actuator, um, which then interacts with what's called proprius some mechanism of proprioception, which, which is what allows the servo to, to know what the current state of the actuator is. So typically in a, in a revolute joint, for example, this would be some form of, of an optical encoder, which would recognize what angle the actuator has rotated to at, at each instant in time. Um, and then, then the third component is, is, a, is an electrical motor controller. So one example of this would be like a four channel H bridge, which is what's actually responsible for taking in motor commands from from some external, um, you know, let's say software, uh, you know, unit, and then applying those those control signals in terms of the electrical current that would affect the the actuator. All right. So th these are kind of the core the core three parts that make up a uh, a typical servo. And so so if we look at even like a little bit more detail of of how these of how these hardware components are actually implemented. Um, when you have a control signal that enters the, 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 uh, the servo, what it'll do is it'll be interpreted by the H bridge. So we have here in this diagram, our control signal comes in and it's interpreted by, uh, by an H bridge, which ultimately is going to decide how much current, um, should be sent to, to the motor where the motor is within the center of this, of this diagram and receives input from the, from, from the H bridge. Um, and so within that, the, 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 standard, um, the standard sort of signal process that these, that these H-bridge controllers use to communicate with the motor is what's called PWM signals. So PWM stands for pulse width, pulse width modulation. And so what that looks like is for, for, one, of these, for one of these controllers, there'll be some predefined period. Um, and so within, within that period, then the, the fraction of, of time in which the controller is sending um, sort of a high signal, right? So it's sending like a, a current. Um, that proportion of time then denotes essentially the like uh, the, the the speed at which the, the motor should should rotate, for example. And so this is how the the controller ultimately kind of interprets that uh, that signal it receives as input into an output electrical current, which the motor can 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 then be uh, affected by. And so if we look then at how this and how these PWM signals are going to affect the motor, there's four, uh, there's four switches within, within the H bridge, which are shown in, you know, in this diagram. So there's A, B, C, and D denotes, denote electrical switches. And by turning off or turning on these switch, these different switches, that's how the, that's how the H bridge controller can actually affect how the, how the motor is acting in terms of its um, in terms of its uh, sort of direction of rotation, or it, um, or whether or not it's even rotating to to begin with. Um, so within these four uh, switches, there's then obviously a number of different ways in which um, in which you can affect the motor, right? So for example, if the H bridge wanted to cause the motor to spin forward, it would switch on A and D, which would allow current to flow through the motor in such a way that the motor would would spin in a let's say clockwise or spin forward direction. Alternatively, if you switched B and C um, and left A and D 
you know, unswitched, um, then the, the current would flow in the opposite direction. So the, the motor would then spin counterclockwise, or we could say spin backward. Um, so, so these are two possible effects that the, that the H bridge controller could have on the motor, but there are, there are others, right? So, so maybe these are questions maybe worth thinking about just to see if you can kind of test yourself, right? So this is not a hardware class, but we do want to briefly kind of cover some of these, um, some of these key ideas as we start to get into control. Um, and so, so one question might, might be, um, what would, what would have, what, what would happen to the motor if there were no switches turned on, right? Well, if there were no switches turned on, then there would be no current flowing through the, flowing through the circuit, through the, through the motor, which would result in no torque on the motor. Um, if we then ask, well, what, what if C and D were on? Well, if C and D were on, then you'd have uh, a negative torque. So this would be a braking action. Similarly, if just A and B are switched, you'd also have a braking action. Um, and then maybe one, maybe a, maybe the most important out of these is if, like, let's say you put A and C on, um, that would be bad because you'd have a short circuit. Um, and so ultimately you would, you would probably destroy a number of the electrical, electrical, electrical components. Um, so that one is, that one is one to avoid. Um, but, uh, but, but these are the possible, you know, interactions that your H-bridge controller can have with, with the motor. So within this then, so as we just looked at, right, so, so the servo controller is going to generate some signal. It's going to be sent to the H-bridge. The H-bridge will decide how to how to affect these switches to ultimately affect the um, the the motor's actuation, and then within that, then there's there's this encoder which is built into the which is built into the servo, and that encoder then is going to send the joint state as the H bridge is acting back to the servo controller, so that the servo knows what the state of the of the motor is in terms of its in terms of of its rotation, and so as the motor is turning this encoder, this optical encoder is sending back signals to the servo um, that are based on the light that's being occluded by, by, a, by, a, by, a, by a device within the, within the encoder, which is illustrated in the red box there. So basically as the motor is turning, there's this variable um, amount of light that's allowed to pass through these, these little kind of windows. And based on that, the the servo can interpret that signal that signal of uh, to to decide what the current rotation state of the motor is. And so and so what these encoders ultimately are doing, right? So by measuring how much the motor has turned over time, it can kind of accumulate that information and then and then know what the current state of the of the motor is. Right. So for our class, right, so again, this is a software class. So how are we going to be implementing a servo controller is probably one thing that you're asking. And so the answer to that, right, is in simulation. So we're not going to be worrying about those low-level nitty-gritty details of the, of the H-bridge. Uh, we're, we're going to be implementing this, um, this controller in our simulated environment, which is going to allow us to focus more on the on the higher level kind of control aspects and not the low level electrical details. All right, so, so within our pendulum environment, right, so we're gonna have a servo controller that's controlling the, the motor at the, at the base of the pendulum, right? So the goal is to apply this motor force so that we can control the pendulum towards a desired set point angle. And so within that then, let's, let's talk about how this servo controller is gonna be implemented. So. So this diagram is one way to, to think about how our controller is going to be interacting with our, with our robot. Um, so the controller is going to be sending commands, which are denoted here by that U sub T, into the robot. Um, and so in literature, you'll typically, you know, in some literature, like in, in embedded systems literature, for example, you'll, you'll see the robot described as a plant, um, sometimes a physical plant. Um, so that sort of abstracts away that it could be a robot, but it could be some other physical some other physical system um, that we're that we're command that we're controlling. Um, so once the command has has gone into the robot, the robot then decides on some on some output state to take, right? And this might be based on the physical dynamics of the robot, um, or it might be based on the, the 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 physical constraints of the of the actuator that this robot has access to. Um, and so based on then the output of those physical states, the the system will take some some configuration. 
and then this process can, can continue. So there's a loop then back where the output state from the, from the robot dynamics goes back into the robot dynamics at the next time step um, so that the robot could kind of continually be updated by this, by this controller. And so if we look at this then in a little bit more detail, so if we focus in on this, on this, uh, on this robot dynamics, um, one way to think about this is we're sort of modeling how the robot is going to change over time based on some command. So we could say that the, um, that the, that the change in the system, so x dot, right, so the, how the system changes, is a function, f, of time, the current state of the system, x, and some command, u. So for our pendulum case, this command, u, is what we can think of as the motor torque within our equation of motion, right? So this, this, this torque is really the only way that we can affect our pendulum. That's the only command that we're, that we're going to be allowed to, to give our motor. Um, and so this robot plant then is representing the complete system dynamics of our, of our pendulum. So this includes the physical dynamics that are being implemented by our equation of motion. All right. So another then um, important detail here is that this, this servo controller is going to be generating commands based on the, based on the desired state. Um, and so one way then that we could think about this is that the output of our controller is the output of a function, right? Where this function depends on, let's say, the time, the current state, and then some desired state, x sub d, okay? And so pi, if you're, you know, within literature, pi is typically referred to as, as a control policy. Um, and so it's, it's canonical to, to define any control policy based on a function pi, if you're, if you're wondering why it is we use, we use that notation. Um, and so within these control policies, there's a few different ways that, that they can be implemented. So broadly, there, you know, two, two categories of, of control policies uh, are shown on this slide. So the first would be what's called open loop control. So in open loop control, the controller is going to generate some command to send to the robot that's agnostic to what the current environment is, right? So it's, it's ignoring what the current um, like any sensor input that the robot might have had access to or any knowledge of what the robot's state was at the previous time step, the robot is just going to continually send these new actions and ignore any, it's just not even going to have access to that, to those sensing and to that other sensing information. So that, that's open loop control. The, the distinction then with closed loop control is that the controller explicitly does have access to feedback from the environment. Um, so in the diagram below, there's this loop that's, that's, um, that's closed, you could say, or the, there's, a, there's this loop that feeds back from the robot state X back into the controller. And so what that's denoting is that at every time step when this controller sends some, some command to the robot, the controller's next um, kind of decision or next process depends on the results of its previous control and, its, and the previous robot dynamics. Um, so in the so, in the, so notationally, in the case of open loop control in the upper half, the command signal is a function of just the control parameters and time, whereas in the lower half, in closed loop control, the control signal is a function of the control parameters, time, and the state of the robot uh, at, the, at the current time step. And so, so, so this is kind of like the high-level difference. Um, and so then you might be wondering like when it is that we would want to use open loop control or when it is we would want to use closed loop control. Um, and so the answer is it depends really on what it is that we want our robots to be doing. Um, and so this is a kind of a fun question to think about, right? So when you see robots, one of the first things that you can, that you can ask yourself is, is that robot using open loop controller or closed loop controller? So on this slide, there's a few, you know, there's a number of examples of, of robot um, and, and, and robotic systems that might be using open loop control, might be using closed loop control. So I'll let you sort of ponder some of these, right? So, so in, the, in the upper left, there's sort of a small kind of um, mechanical toy. Then in the, in the upper middle, there's, that's an example of an animatronic robot. Um, in the upper right, there's a, what looks to be a manufacturing robot, like a robotic arm. And then, and then we have Furbo, the, the kind of funny character Furbo. Um, there's, an, there's an iRoomba vacuum cleaner in the lower left. Um, maybe a smart thermostat could be, could be thought of as a robotic system. 
So, so it's, a, it's a good question to, to think about. We'll, we'll look at a couple examples. So, so the first example we can look at is the, is the Furby. Um, and so I've turned off the sound for this particular video, but uh, for those of you that want the, the chorus of Furbies uh, to, uh, to be singing, then if you, you, know, if you go and, and look at this channel, they, they, have a, they have this video clip of this collection of Furbies sort of interacting with each other to some extent. Um, uh, that is, it does create quite a harmony. Um, and so if you're not familiar, so, so these Furbies are sort of a, a sort of children's toy robot that, uh, that perform like a sort of song and dance, and you can see like their eyes light up and kind of, um, you know, emote. Um, and so these, these Furbies are, are a nice example of actually open loop, uh, open loop control. Um, so in this case, they don't have any sensory input. Their whole routine, their whole dance routine and singing routine is pre-scripted. Um, basically, within the within the robot itself, there's there's a cylinder that has kind of etched into it the the various um, uh, sort of internal controls that then affect the the, the dance routine. So so this is an example of open loop uh, control because there's no feedback from any sort of sensor input, and the and the dance routine doesn't change based on based on the environment. Another example of open loop control would be would be from animatronics. So, for example, in, in Disney World or Disneyland, um, or potentially mu you know, museum installations that might show historical figures, like the one that's uh, that's sort of shown in this in this video clip here, um, you know, these are examples again of, of open loop control robots that don't take any sensor input, um, but simply have a pre recorded script that they follow through in terms of their actions, um, and that that doesn't change based on the environment. So this is a really you know so this open loop control is a really nice. Um, kind of policy to use when you want like guaranteed behavior and when that behavior shouldn't depend on the environment like is the case in these kind of museum installations but for but for our purposes right we're actually more interested in closed loop control right uh, what we could think of, of as feedback control where the the environment feeds back into the controller and affects the the resulting um, uh, mo motor commands um, and so this feedback control is going to give us much more opportunity for the autonomous robots to actually interact with their environment and to, for their behavior to depend really on the environment, because that's what we're after. And so if we look at the, there, there are a number of different types of feedback control that, uh, that, that we, could, we could implement, right? So we have standard feedback control, which is, um, which is shown here just in this diagram that we talked about in the past slides. Um, but in addition, there's, a, there's a, another type of feedback control, which is what we're going to be talking about for project two, which is negative feedback control. Um, where essentially there's some, this is how we would represent a desired configuration for the robot to take. And so based on that, the difference between the current state of the robot and the desired state, that then is incorporated into the, into the controller's input. And so this is where PID control is gonna be, is gonna come in. Um, in addition, there, there's another type of feedback controller, uh, which is negative feedback and feed forward control. So for, so this feed forward component that's added in the, in the final, uh, schematic here is meant to denote, um, you know, sort of m meant to model cases where the controller would be able to anticipate um, essentially like effects in the environment and then incorporate those into the control, right? So this could be to, for things like counteracting gravity or counteracting wind resistance, things like that, that could be anticipated without having to directly observe the environment at the current um, time step. You can incorporate those mechanisms into a feed forward controller. But for our purposes, um, and for the purposes of assignment two, we're going to be focusing on PID control. Um, so this, this example of negative feedback control. So the acronym PID stands for proportional integrative derivative. Um, so anytime we say PID control, we're talking about a proportional integral derivative control. Um, and so ultimately what this, uh, what this control model comes down to is it's a sum of, of different response errors. So in the diagram here, we, we have three boxes for the, P, for the proportional term, the integral term, and the derivative term in the green, blue, and, and orange boxes, respectively. And so these, uh, these, these error terms get summed uh, within, the, within the summation circle, uh, and that then is what forms our command, our, our control command. Um, and so this, this PID control is modeled on a sort of mass spring and damper system, which we'll talk about. Um, and in addition to that, the, the controller, when, when we say it's it's, it's responding to, to error, the, the feedback is trying to correct some delta between the current state and the desired state. And so that correction is based on the current error, the past error, and the predicted, the predicted future error, um, which, which we'll go into. Uh, 
So for our pendulum, the x in all of these, in, 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 you know, in this slide and in these diagrams and, and equations, is, is the pendulum angle, so, so theta from our, from our slides on the pendulum. Right? So that's the state of the, of the pendulum. Um, and so our error signal then is going to be the difference between the pendulum angle that's desired and the current pendulum angle. So in, in the notation here, right, so the error at time t is the difference between the desired state x and the current state x. Um, in, and so then within that, then the control signal is, is described below where again, those, those different p, i, and d terms are, are highlighted. And so we're gonna go through each one of them um, and consider what effect they have on this control behavior. The one other notational um, detail I'll point out is that you're probably, you might be asking what the k terms within that control signal equation are. And so th those are what's referred to as the PID gains. Um, and so those are tuning parameters essentially that get, get, get sort of preset uh, by the engineer, by the developer, um, and then they affect the control behavior um, once, once the system is deployed. So we'll talk about gain tuning um, after we've gone through the, the different PID uh, uh, terms and, and look at what effect they have. So, so, to, so to sort of um, start to build some intuition about PID control and to build some understanding, let's consider uh, what a PID controller would typically, uh, how a PID controller would typically behave with respect to some state over time. So the horizontal axis we'll look at is, is time, and then we'll consider just a single variable state, which is gonna be shown on the, on the vertical axis. So this state we can think of as being like the position of a robot in one dimension, okay? Or alternatively, the, the angle of our pendulum, right? So it's a, it's a single, uh, it's a one dimensional uh, variable. And so let's say then that for our controller, we have some set point, some desired state that we want the, the, uh, ro the robot to be in, and let's, let's denote this as x sub d, and then we can draw in our, in our diagram here where this, where this set point is over time, right? So the set point stays constant in this, in this example over time, and fixed at this x sub d. Um, so in, in assignment two, this would be the, the des once again, this would be the, the desired angle for our pendulum, right? Uh, and so within this, then we could ask uh, at a specific time t, where is our, where is our current, uh, where is our, what, what state is our robot currently in? Um, and so by drawing it out over time, then we're gonna get a sense of how the controller is behaving. Um, so, this, so this blue line is tracing out a path through configuration space over time, right? So it's showing how the robot has changed in its state as time moves forward up to the current time step of, you know, where time equals sub uh, t. Um, so this x sub t then is the, is the current state of the robot as it's being controlled. And so this is just one possible uh, kind of behavior for our controller, right? So this is just an example for, for us to look at these, um, for, for us to look at these PID terms. So within a PID controller, if it was applied to, to this system, the first term in that, in, that, uh, in that acronym, right, is the P term, right, the proportional term. And so what the proportional term represents is the current delta between the desired state and the current state. So, so P is just the error, right? So we can think of P as being a spring error that's trying to apply force towards the desired state. So it's trying to drive the, uh, it's trying to create a control command that's gonna drive the current state towards the desired state. Um, so in this case, for example, you're gonna have a, like this, this, this vector is pointing up, so you're gonna have some positive error which is going to be trying to drive the control command to be to be larger, um, or at least positive, and and so moving hopefully the current position towards towards the goal. All right, so that's the proportional term. The integral term, on the other hand, is looking at all of the past errors and integrating those past errors in time. So what the integral term does is it's going to continually add force to the to our control term until the until essentially the, the error uh, goes to zero. And at that point, it will no longer add additional force. Um, so over time, this integral term is gonna continually grow, right? It, you, you keep adding error and error and error over time until the current state has reached the desired state. And then the integral term stops growing. Um, 
And so you, so again, so we can think about this as being the sum of all the past errors in time, right? So this term is going to grow. The, the final term then is the, is the D term, so the, the derivative. And so the, the derivative term is trying to consider, to some extent, the sort of future error. Um, so the derivative term applies to the rate of change of the error. So one way that we could, that we could think about this is when, when you approximate the, the, the derivative, Right, what you're going to do is you're going to take the difference between the past error and the and the uh, excuse me the, the the current error and the past error, um, and so what this is going to do is it's going to essentially damp down the, um, the 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 force that's applied, and it's going to try and release some energy from the from the system. So this should help with our stability ultimately of our of our controller, um, and so so to build a bit more. Um, Kind of intuition. Let's consider how these terms would actually kind of relate, or so how the PID behavior would 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 um, would sort of look based on these different terms and, and their gains. So on this particular, so anytime we talk about PID controllers, or anytime you sort of read about PID controllers, you're going to see figures that look very similar to this. Um, and so what again, it's it's the same concept where on the horizontal axis we're showing time, and then the vertical axis is denoting the the state of the of the system, and then the different lines here are showing the behavior from slightly from slightly different PID controllers. Where the by slightly different, I mean that the gains those k terms were tuned slightly differently, and so based on those slight those slight hyperparameters being tuned in different ways, we will get different behavior. So the the first line let's focus on is the is the, the line that has the arrow, so the the very fast response time, so the the sort of light gray um, the the light green odds light gray line that oscillates quite substantially. Um, this, this, this particular behavior is representing a, like a very fast controller, so it responds very, very quickly, meaning initially the, the error go, becomes very low, right? So initially this controller moves the, the state of the robot towards the desired state, sort of fastest out of the three lines that we're considering here. Um, but the problem with this one is that it sort of moves too fast, right? And so we get this instability where it overshoots the desired, the the desired state by by a pretty substantial amount, and then, and then again it tries to recover by by sort of overshooting the desired state down in in the in the other direction, right? And so there's this continual oscillation that we have, until eventually, sort of around time equals uh, let's say ten units, the the controller finally stabilizes. And so the the issue with this type of behavior. Is that on a physical system, those 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 drastic changes in the current in the state of the robot can cause um, basically mechanical failure. Um, so this is something that you don't want to be around a robot that's that has a PID controller implemented like this um, because it would be dangerous to be around. Um, on the other hand, then if we focus on the the solid black line, this would be a PID controller that has um, you know what we might call like acceptable stability. Where it doesn't have that that substantial oscillation um, that that we saw in the first in the first PID controller, um, and it's 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 not quite as fast in its response time, but it's um, but it does still achieve the desired state at around you know let's say like time equals nine or ten, um, but again it's it's much smoother in its control. It doesn't have those those wild oscillations about the desired state, and then finally in the 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 sort of lowest line in this figure, which has the, the arrow denoted very stable performance. So this particular PID controller would be sort of an underpowered controller where it, uh, it does eventually reach the, the desired state, but the time, the, the response time that it takes to reach the desired state is much longer than, than the initial two controllers. Um, and so as a result, this might not be uh, a suitable controller for cases where the robot has to take actions in a you know, in a finite amount of time. Um, it might just be too slow, too underpowered. So, so this kind of visualization is good to build some, some intuition about how PID controllers can possibly behave depending on their tuning. Um, but, but let's go and look back at, at, our, at our model of the PID controller as a spring and damper uh, system. So, so once again, so this was our, so this was our, uh, our schematic of how the PID controller can be thought of uh, in terms of accumulating these these different PID terms, um, and so one thing that we can can consider is if we focus on the proportional term, so the, the p term, um, 
This term actually can be thought of as describing the motion of a mass spring damper system. And so from, from kind of some uh, somewhat elementary physics, there's, there's this notion of Hooke's law. So if you ever, remember, if you ever studied in, in physics, um, spring and damper systems or oscillating springs, um, this, this might look familiar. So Hooke's law describes how these, how these mass spring systems um, can, be, can be affected by force in relation to, uh, to, the, to the displacement of the current state of the, of the mass. Right? So in this particular equation, the force is capital F. The X would be the, the displacement of the mass from some, from some set point. And then the K denotes some, some spring stiffness that, uh, that is a property of the actual physical system. And so this spring stiffness within our, within our proportional term is the gain. So we have the flexibility of changing our gain, our K term, in order to achieve the, the sort of spring effect, the sort of spring damping behavior that is ideal for our, for our robots. Um, and so another way then that we could, that we could sort of visualize this, this notion of a spring damper system is in, is in this particular figure here. And so what it's, what it's uh, visualizing is how Depending on the depending on the compression or the elongation of our spring, which would which would correspond to the 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 displacement in in the position of our robotic state, depending on that on that displacement, the amount of force that's being essentially applied to the system, which in the robotic case would mean the amount of control command or the amount of torque that we're applying, will change. So for systems that are very very elongated there's going to be a much greater amount of force being applied, whereas for systems that are much more compressed, there's less force being exerted by the, by the spring, right? So similarly, in our, in our case of the, of the uh, PID controller on a robotic, on a robotic uh, actuator, for cases where there's a very large displacement in that, within that uh, P term, there's going to be a much larger control command, right? Like a much larger force being applied. Whereas for cases where the displacement between the current state and the desired state is much smaller, so there's kind of like that compression state, the force and the control command that's being applied is going to be much, much smaller. Um, and so, so if we go back to, to our figure here, right, so another way that we could, that we could uh, sort of analyze these, these different behaviors of our, of our system would be in terms of the sort of stiffness of this, of this spring dampening model. Um, so, for, so for the controller we looked at um, that had that overshooting behavior, we could consider that to be an overstiff spring um, that causes that, that sort of wild oscillation. Um, on the other hand, the, the reasonable controller in green, which is shown in the, as the green line here, uh, would, be, would be a case where the, where the behavior was acceptable. And then finally, the, the understiff line uh, is, is again denoting like this concept that uh, there's sort of not enough um, force that's being applied by this, by this spring in order to, to um, kind of remove that displacement that exists between the current state and the, and the desired state. Okay, so within this then, so the, the next thing that we could look at, uh, again, within this spring damper model would be the, would be the, uh, would be the, 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 the dampening term. So if we focus on the, on the D term within PID control, we can add it to our model of spring dampening as is shown on, on this slide. So what we've done uh, is we've taken our spring, our, just our spring system that, that we looked at before, and now we're adding the, the dampening term. So in the, in the equation, the, the negative B x dot term is, uh, can be thought of as like a, a corresponding to our, to our D term from the PID controller. If we assume that, that there, there's a constant set point, then whereas in the D term we have a derivative with respect to error, we can instead think about as a derivative with respect to position, which is shown in the, in the equation. Uh, for f equals negative kx neg uh, minus b x dot. And so what this corresponds to in a physical system then is shown in, in the lower left, where in addition to having a spring attached to our, to our, to our mass, we've added now a, a physical damper, uh, right? And so the purpose of this damper in the physical system is to remove energy, right? So we're trying to release some of the, some of the energy that might have been built up. And so mathematically, what, what we do with the D term in PID control can be thought of in the, in the same way. So, we're so this term is used to release energy and to try and um, essentially dampen the, the, the control uh, commands. So if we go back to our, um, to our PID controller kind of profiles and we consider what, uh, what behavior might be, might be um, caused by, 
by changing the, the dampening term. So this, this slide gives some visual um, intuition about what you can expect if you, if you have a, an overdamped or an underdamped system. Um, and so the, 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 the main thing just to point out is that the, the more damping you have, the smoother the behavior you can expect. So there's going to be sort of less overshoots and less extreme overshoots, which is what the, the black, like the dark black line is, is illustrating. That's an overdamped system. Whereas the, the less damping you have, you're going to tend to have more overshoots uh, from, the, from, from the desired set point, and, and they will typically happen more frequently. Um, so as you tune your, your, your PID controller and as you tune the, the dampening term, um, you know, the, thinking about how you want your system to, to behave with respect to sort of smoothly ap approaching the, the desired state uh, is, a, is a useful strategy. Okay, so we've looked at the proportional term, we've looked at the derivative term. So the, the final term then that we'll look at is the, is the integral term, which we can think about as trying to account for the, for the past error that has, that has built up in the system. Um, so another way of saying that is that the, the integral term handles steady state error. So when we say steady state, what we're referring to is a case where our system has, uh, has essentially stopped improving with respect to the, to the desired state. So there's, there, so for some, for some reason, the, the control commands that are being sent are no longer moving the, moving the, the, uh, the system towards the desired state. And so this could be caused by some external force, right? So this could be caused like a gravity term. It could be caused by, by a weak motor um, or other kind of system errors. And so PID compensates for these types of errors by trying to accumulate the, uh, the, uh, the positional error over time and incorporating that accumulation into the commands that are sent to the, uh, to the controller, or to the, to the motor, rather. Um, and so what this then would, would look like, again, going back to our kind of PID um, profile plot, would be, would be the following. So, so as you change the tuning of the integral term, just as we saw for the P term and the D term, we'll expect to see slightly different performance with respect to our controller arriving at the desired set point. And so in particular, what the integral term will, will do is it's going to affect, um, you know, it can affect those same kind of behaviors in terms of how fast the state will arrive at the desired set point, and then also how extreme the, the overshoots or potentially undershoot of the desired set point will be. Um, so without any integral term, it's very possible that we would actually completely undershoot the desired set point. Um, but once you introduce the integral term, um, you know, that, that, that's a way of, of, uh, of fixing that steady state error. All right, so, so now let's talk a little bit about gain tuning. So I've, I've mentioned throughout that we have these K terms within our, within our equation for the PID controller. And so these K terms are kind of hyperparameters that, that you get to tune and you get to set as a developer of, of one of these control systems. And so just implementing just the PID algorithm uh, without, these, without, these, without these gains being tuned will not necessarily result in, in good performance or a good controller. Um, and so the, the reason for that is that depending on the system, depending on the physical system, meaning the effect of gravity or friction or the, the strength of the motor torque, right, all of these, these components, these will affect the, the PID algorithm. And so the, the gains then are a way of accounting for those system-specific uh, settings and trying to ensure that the, that the algorithm works effectively in those unique in these unique system settings. And so selecting these, these gain terms is gonna, is gonna have a very substantial effect on the performance of, of the PID controller. And to be honest, PID gain tuning um, is somewhat of an art. Um, it's not strictly a science. And so choosing these gains carefully is gonna be, um, is going to be an important uh, detail for your, for your assignment too. Um, so this slide here is meant to help with, with the gain tuning, right? So we say it's more of an art than a, than a science, um, but there are some, um, some common kind of behaviors that you can look for in your, in your PID controller and then infer how the gains might, uh, might could, you know, be changed to improve the performance. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over too many of these. The, the main ones maybe I'll, I'll point out is if you have steady state error, then what you want to do is focus on the K sub I. So the, the integral term, um, in addition, then I would say if you have overshoot, you might want to you might want to consider increasing your proportional term, um, and and following you know f following this this particular table as something of a heuristic, so it kind of guides your tuning, is a good idea, um, but it's not a strict rule. I mean, it, you you as you tune your your gains, you're probably gonna deviate from this in, in some ways, and that's okay. 
Um, one other topic on, on PID tuning, if, you, if you're curious about a somewhat more, um, instead of sort of hand tuning, if you're curious about a more mathematical approach, you can, you can read into this Ziegler-Nichols PID tuning. Um, so this is an approach that, uh, that is more kind of mathematically founded, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna focus on this. We're not gonna require it for this course because you can, you can tune the gains by hand and achieve, um, very, um, you know, very, uh, desirable performance of your controller. Uh, but if you're curious, this is something you could explore, um, on your own. In addition, then we can, we can point out a couple of approaches that we on the core staff have used, uh, for tuning our controllers that we find, um, is useful. The first thing is to start with all of the gains at, at zero, instead of starting with them at, at let's say, one, and then, to, and, then to, and then to begin by introducing the terms um, kind of one by one. So we typically would start with the proportional term until we, meet the, until we roughly meet the desired state. Um, in, in our systems, we likely won't have undershoot error, but we could have overshoot error. Um, so this, this KP term is the first one that we introduce, and then based on the overshoot that we see, then we would introduce the, the, the derivative term. And then finally, if we, if we still are, are kind of unsatisfied with the stability, then we could introduce the, the, the integral term and, uh, until we reach some desired um, kind of criteria for our performance in terms of its stability. Um, and so once again, you know, you'll, you'll probably refine these, these, these gains and you'll, and you'll find that the performance of your, of your uh, controller varies pretty substantially as these gains are tuned. Okay, so with that, now that we've covered the PID controller, now let's try and put the PID controller together with the dynamical simulation that we looked at last lecture um, so, that, so that you'll be all set for from project two. Um, and so once again, so, so for project two, we're implementing the, the pendulum system where we're gonna do both dynamical simulation of the physics of the pendulum, and then we're gonna control the, the pendulum by applying a, a motor torque. So from the, from the previous lecture, we looked at how we can derive the equations of motion for, for the simple pendulum. And we talked about then the, the integrators, um, the Euler integrator, the Verlet integrator, and the, Verlet, and the velocity Verlet integrator, right? And so schematically then what, what we can kind of do for, for picturing how this, how this physical simulation will be implemented is it's gonna be implemented in this loop fashion, right? Where at, so starting on the left side of the loop, right? So we have some initial state of the, of the pendulum at time t which is given by the pendulum angle and the, and the angular velocity. So this is theta sub t and theta dot sub t. So this current state of the pendulum goes into our pendulum dynamics, which is based on the equations of motion for the, for the pendulum. And that then produces an updated state for the next time step, which is the x t plus dt. So this dynamics is getting implemented in a loop fashion, right? So iteratively over time, every time the pendulum gets, gets animated, this simulator will run one step forward and predict the state at the next time step. So this is going to be happening in a loop. And on top of it, then we're going to implement our feedback controller, which is based on the PID control algorithm that we, that we discussed in this lecture. And so the way then that we can schematically draw this is, is given here in this diagram. So our, so it's going to integrate with this physical simulation that we have in the pendulum dynamics. And so the way then that the simulator works is once again, we can imagine starting with the current state of the pendulum given by an angle and an angular velocity. From that, that, that uh, pendulum state will go into the dynamics and update the time step at the next, at the next time step. But in between that update, we can, we can calculate what the PID control term is going to be. And so how this works is that you, you follow the, the current state up into the error module, right? So the error is going to be based on the delta between the desired state of the pendulum, which is the desired angle and steady angular velocity, meaning no, no angular velocity. Um, so, so the error is the, the, the difference with respect to the, that desired state and the current state, right? So based on the error, you can then calculate the PID control term, which gives you the torque so that before you calculate the state at the next time step, you know what the torque that's been applied to the pendulum is. So you can think about the controller as being implemented just before the pendulum dynamics gets updated for the next time step. And so if you implement it in this fashion, what will happen is that the, the state of the pendulum at the next time step depends on the control from the current time step. And so that's how we're gonna get the behavior in our, in our 
in our controller that we're that we're looking for in order to to control the pendulum arm. So one um, one warning and one thing to think about when you're when you're implementing these controllers is the fact that because we tune them for the particular system that we're that we're focusing on. So in this case, the pendulum system under gravity without any friction. The the fact of the matter is that the if you change the system. Um, so if you change the gravity term, or if you add friction, or if you add a second, uh, a second link to the pendulum, then you're going to have to change the gains in all likelihood for the performance to remain acceptable. Because again, those gains were sort of fine-tuned on one specific physics uh, environment. And then if you change the environment, you're going to have to change the, the tuning. Um, and so with that, then maybe we're thinking a little bit about what other types of systems we might be able to apply some of these ideas that we've talked about. So these ideas of PID controllers. So one very common system where you'll see PID control applied to is uh, like a cart pull balance system. Um, so in this di diagram here, it's an illustration of one of these systems where the, the cart itself can move back and forth. And on top of it, then you have an inverted pendulum, which typically you try and keep upright uh, by, by moving the base of the robot. So in this particular example, it's, a, it's an implementation of, of this uh, cart pole balancer. And so you can see the, uh, the, the, you know, the person is, is, effect, is sort of introducing external forces into the system, uh, but because the cart has a, has a you know, pretty impressive controller on top of it, you know, running the, the control for it, uh, the, the inverted pendulum that sits on top of the cart stays stable. Uh, and so we can, we can look at another example of this of this system here, um, where again the, the the cart is able to maintain the stable uh, you know stable configuration for its for its pendulum um, based on a feedback controller. Um, you know another case where where you know you could implement PID control and some of the the feedback control that we've talked about would be a differential drive inverted pendulum, also known as a Segway, um, and so you know this is a this is one. Popular example of, of you know where you have likely seen PID sort of implemented in uh, in in the wild, so to speak, um, and so similar to that, there are like a lot of examples on YouTube of of people who have implemented their inverted pendulums, similar to the to the ones that we saw earlier in this lecture from uh, from some of the courses here at the University of Michigan, um, and so in this particular case, it's an example of a of an inverted pendulum that actually can be controlled to to, to drive in a in a specified direction. So this is a little bit more complicated controller involved here, right? Because you have the now sort of a set point as being a, a, like a, a translation in addition to keeping the pendulum inverted and upright. But these are just a few. Uh, there's, there's a, there really are a lot of other cases where PID control and especially feedback control more, more generally are used within, within robotic systems. Um, and so we're just starting to kind of scratch the surface with this, with this project. So with that, um, one thing maybe to highlight for the, uh, for the upcoming kind of topics that we're going to be talking about is, uh, we'll sp is to sort of brush up on some of our linear algebra and coordinate systems. So we'll spend next, uh, next lecture this week talking about a linear algebra review and kind of refresher. But what that's going to lead into then is the next major topic for, uh, for this course, which is on robot kinematics. So what we're going to be focusing then on in projects three and four is forward kinematics, um, and then we're going to eventually get to, to inverse kinematics. So this is where we're going to actually be working in three-dimensional, uh, in a three-dimensional environment with uh, with with multi-part articulated robots and and controlling them and simulating them, which can be really exciting. And so with that, that concludes our fifth lecture on PID control. And uh, so thanks for thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you this week.